Now, unfortunately, every atheist, every agnostic, every Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Jew, Muslim has faith. The nature of reality, the nature of living in this world is that if you don't trust, you're going to be a very lonely, isolated person. If you don't have some way to answer the question, what is real? What is the good life? What is a good person? How do I become a good person? You're not thinking very clearly. So Christ does not call us to commit intellectual suicide. Instead, he calls us to think deeply about life to examine what he claims to be true. That although matter and energy is real, matter and energy comes from a creator God. Although life is a precious gift, it's not just an accident. It's been given us by God for a purpose. So there's ultimate meaning to life. And guess what? Nazism and hedonism are qualitatively different from the golden rule, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's not all relative, it's not all subjective. You know that. Every one of my atheist friends knows very well that there's a qualitative difference between Nazism, Hedonism, and the Golden Rule. And if you think about it, you'll realize the Golden Rule is far truer. It's far more reliable. It makes far more sense than Nazism or Hedonism. Don't take it from me. Read the Gospels for yourself. Examine the evidence that Jesus Christ is reliable and credible. And then based on that evidence, you make your own commitment and trust in Jesus Christ. Where is justice? What is mercy? Where is the sacred and the holy? In this world full of choices, where is the truth in all the voices? Don't waste my time Tell it to me straight The truth is getting hard to find I have objections to what I've learned I have questions and concerns Give me an answer Hi, um, okay, so I have a question about abortion and um, a question about how, um, say if someone was like raped or something, and would that be considered sinful almost to get an abortion? Okay, difficult question, very difficult question. First of all, is abortion wrong? If so, why? Um, I mean, it really, I mean, actually, I don't really see it wrong in a lot of cases. I kind of see it wrong as if, um, as someone that puts themselves out there, doesn't use protection, or doesn't try to do anything, and then they get pregnant and they just abort it just because it's just easier. But I don't see it okay if someone, say, you get raped or something, and you have to deal with that the rest of your life when it was not you and when there's ways out of it. Okay, but I still don't understand why you think abortion is wrong simply because I think it's wrong if you don't ask for it like I mean if you're asking for it like you're just putting yourself out there you're not using protection or anything and you're just and you get pregnant and you're like oh well I can just abort it and blah blah, blah. and then you continuously do that or something like that I think that's wrong why because it's not it's you're just you're not what are you doing why don't you just use protection and avoid it in general well according to some people all you're doing is removing excess skin from your body I remove excess skin from my body all the time. I peel my calluses, I cut my fingernails, and I definitely get a haircut. So if abortion is simply removing excess skin from a, from a woman's body, what's wrong with abortion? How, how can one possibly argue that abortion is well, wrong if that? abortion is simply removing excess skin from a body? Well, then are you against it then? Well, yeah, but I can promise you I've got some reason. Well, can I hear them? Absolutely, okay. thanks for asking. Thank That's kind of what I wanted to hear. All righty. <laughs> All right, obviously, I don't think there's anything wrong with removing excess skin from a body. Therefore, if a fetus is simply excess skin, there's nothing wrong with abortion. So what I obviously have to ask myself is, when does human life begin? Because if a fetus is a human life, and if abortion is ending a human life motivated by inconvenience, selfishness, 
then I'm afraid we got murder on our hands here. That's how I would define murder. If I just come up to you and blow you away because I don't like you, that's murder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely evil. Why? Because you have intrinsic value. You're valuable, I would insist, because you're a human being created in the image of God. That's why you're valuable. He has given you significance and worth. You're a treasure. All right. And guess what? I'm convinced that before you pass down a birth canal, you still have that value. You see, I don't think your value begins when you start sucking air. I think you're valuable when you're alive. So the difficult question for me is, for all of us is, when does human life begin? Now, you go to any major u university medical center in the United States, and if a body lying on an in care in an intensive care unit has brain activity and heartbeat, doctors and nurses are legally responsible to do everything within their power to sustain that life. Great question. So if basically, um, basically you're saying that before like when the cells are just multiplying and everything, you don't consider that like getting an abortion. Or you consider it when it's actually like alive in your body, like kicking and everything? Okay. Great question. And that's what we're trying to answer here. Okay. So we're right on, we're, we're spot on together here. All right. So brain activity and heartbeat occurs between six to eight weeks after conception. So I would hope that most of us could agree that between six to eight weeks after conception, when that quote little piece of skin in a woman's womb has both brain activity and heartbeat, it's obviously not a piece of skin. It's obviously a human life. Brain activity, heartbeat. Pretty rudimentary definition of human life. Okay, but what about pre six to eight weeks? Is that a human life or not? That's the question. Exactly. Okay, so I've got to ask myself, What's the difference in kind between a one-minute-old fertilized egg, an eight-week-old fertilized egg, a nine-month-old fertilized egg, a nine-year-old fertilized egg, a 90-year-old fertilized egg? There's only a difference in degree of maturation. There is no difference in kind. That one-minute-old fertilized egg is never going to come down the birth canal as an alligator, a chicken, or a pig. 100 times out of 100, that fertilized egg is going to come down that birth canal as a human being. That is why I would argue that as soon as that egg and that sperm are together, that that is a life. But you just said that it's not really living. There's no brain activity or anything. Right. Correct. So no, no brain activity, no heartbeat. It has potential. That's just like saying, I'm going to plant this seed and it has potential to be a flower or whatever. It's kind of... So why, why, like, why would you, like, so, so someone gets raped, would that be wrong if they basically got an abortion? Okay, now that, you see, that's a totally different ethical situation. Well, I'm just saying, like, right? well, you say in general it's considered murder. Is that what you're saying? Well, remember how I define murder. If this guy pulls out a knife and starts knifing you to death, and I go and hit him as hard as I can to stop him from knifing you, and in the process I break his neck, that's not murder. I am seeking to defend an innocent person from being knifed to death by this guy. See, that's killing, but the motive is to protect you from being murdered by him. I would define murder as killing, not just killing, but killing motivated by selfishness, hatred, or revenge. So would you consider it selfish? If someone, say, 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 Say you're a girl, you're a beautiful little girl, and you're walking down the street, and some guy comes after you, and he rapes you, and you, you don't know what to do, you didn't know, and so on, that happens, and then you realize you're pregnant. Would it be selfish to just get rid of it, or? I don't know, I think you're gonna have to answer that for yourself. Well, I mean, I have answered for myself, I'm curious about you. I have the utmost respect for a woman who has died named Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa at the National Prayer Breakfast stood up between President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. And Mother Teresa said, please do not abort your babies anymore. If you don't want your babies, send them to me and I will find a home for them. And this little diminutive woman who worked among the dying in Calcutta, India, stands there between two of the most powerful individuals on the planet, President of the United States and Vice President, and pleads with them. How do you think you can grow a society of compassionate people if you support the slaughter of innocent children. 
So if you don't want your babies, send them to me, Mother Teresa says, and I'll find a home for them. I'm impressed by that. Very impressed. That is impressive. So, but, I mean, I, I still don't understand, like, what, what's your opinion on it? Or any situation, do you think underage people, um, say like Sarah Palin's daughter, are you more for her having a baby in that sense? All right. Than... All right, I'll answer you head to head to head. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's the good stuff. Today, if your mother and father told me we did not want her, I don't think that changes the value of your life. Tonight, if your mom and dad tell me, you know, we really didn't want her at all, and we seriously considered aborting her, I will look them in the face and say, I am so grateful you allowed her to be born and you brought her into this world. So, <laughs> but I don't, I don't understand, like, so does that mean that you, you support anything? Is that what you're saying? You support that? You're happy that all right, I'll take I, another was, I'll, I was born? But I'm very happy you I were born, yes. It would have been like you never would have known, so. No, but your mom and dad would have known that they had aborted you. You see, I have to consistently deal with couples and people who do abort, okay? And I've got to continue. I, I work with people who have aborted, and therefore I see the guilt, I see the shame, and we've got to work that through, and that's hard, and that's painful. When a woman finally wakes up to the fact that that was a human life, I aborted. That's a heavy-duty thing. So when do you think that people become who they are? When they're, when they're just like right when the egg and the sperm like hit or as a baby develops and as it develops as a child because is it just any egg or any sperm that could be anyone or could you pretty much it could happen another time all right let me ask you why can't it just be another time why why does it they have to regret right. abortion do you have any problem with what used to be the practice in india of taking amniocentesis and then if the fetus was female Abortion took place immediately. If the fetus was male, the child was brought to term. That's almost like in China right now. Okay, good. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, yeah. Okay, what's your problem with that? Because that's just gender side. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that doesn't, that's not, that's completely different from the situation I'm talking about. Because that's just like, oh, I have a, I have a female, I'm just going to abort her. That's not... That's not being someone that doesn't know what to do, that doesn't think that they can handle a baby, and doesn't think they can handle the process of having a baby, and actually going through with it, and being stuck with that, and having that issue, that burden on them. Okay, the question that hits me real hard is, what is the difference between saying, no, amniocentesis, you're not allowed to do that in order to determine the sex of a child, and then abort just female fetuses and keep male fetuses to term because that's sexism, that's gender discrimination. You're not allowed to do that. And I agree. But if it's male or female and you just arbitrarily want to abort it, that's fine. Do you have no problem with that? Well, that's not really the situation. It's not, it's just in general, if you don't want a baby, you're going to abort. It's not the fact that you're going against the fact that it's a male or female and you're just going to kill something that's already grown and that you know the sex by that point that's uh -huh. not that's not what i'm saying i'm talking about just in general the abortion of a child right maybe before it even develops right but you see man my point is real simple if you're going to be so opposed to the abortion of female fetuses after amniocentesis has been performed you know very well what you're saying is that's a life that's a female life that's that you're that wiping yes. out right Okay, now if you're so committed to preserving female lives, then I hope you're de equally committed to preserving male lives as well. So let's not abort female or male. However, that's, it's not like I'm saying before they even become, uh, they're, they're still like before the six weeks. What about before the six weeks? That's well, not even like, I don't consider that really like living exactly yet because it's not, it doesn't even have a brain as you said, like, like brain activity or whatever as you said. All right. So, but man, when you were a one minute old fertilized egg, you had all the chromosomes that are necessary to be human. Yeah. There was no change in kind between you at one minute old fertilized egg and you as a 20 year old. But that's just saying like, like monthly menstruation, we release an egg. Or 
or just like when guys ejaculate, they release sperm. That's just like, oh, that there goes that um, chromosomes, or there goes those chromosomes. That's just any situation. So why the point when they touch when they're still not like actual being yet in my sense? They're just multiplying. An egg on its own never becomes a human being. Sperm on its own never becomes a human being. Yeah. It's the coming together of the egg and the sperm, which is life then. It's a human life. But, we're, but you still don't know where it starts, and you admitted to that. No, I, am, I believe that when that egg and that sperm come together, uninterrupted, that is a human life. An abortion is an interruption. It's a termination of that human life. That's why I'm opposed to abortion. Oh, there you go. I was just wondering. All so. right, good. Thank you very much no for raising the question. Appreciate Thank it. <laughs> All of the teachings of Christ come from a book that's 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. We agree. It's, it has been passed down. I mean, religion is often thought, thought of as a tradition type of thing. As it's, been, it's just passed down from generation to generation. Your belief in Christ is no different than what I just laid out. Your parents undoubtedly are, maybe not your parents. I mean, I understand there are Christians that are exposed to it from other sources outside of their family, but the majority are indoctrinated into it. In every single religion. And I really? Can go, yes. Where was the center of Christianity in the first century? Jerusalem, Palestine. Where did the center of Christianity move? Up to Antioch, Syria down to Egypt. Then where did the center of Christianity move? You think no people? Western people? Europe. Then where did the center of Christianity move? Good old US of A. Now, today, where is the center of Christianity? It's in Africa, South America. And within the next five to 10 years, where will the center of Christianity be? China. There will be more followers of Christ in China than anywhere else in the world. Sir, I can promise you, Faith in Christ is not a cultural bias. Faith in Christ is a deeply personal decision, and the center of Christianity is not in one spot. It's moved all around the world. I'll grant you that. I mean, yes, there are such things as missionaries that do travel to other parts of the world and spread the word of Christ. Now, when a missionary comes over with a nice, hardback book, maybe even an iPad nowadays, you're kind of in a sense of authority in those, like over those people. Uh, they, they kind of respect you and, and respect what you have to say. I would submit you to better you, watch sir, that, out where you're heading. that it's not difficult to convince these people. Oh, I see. So all them dumb people in all their cultures it, it just get blown them. out of the water by them missionaries with their iPads with and iPods. Give me a break. If that is not cultural elitism on your part, I don't know what is. Africans put their if faith in Christ because they're change it to respect. rational people with a conscience and they're open to God's existence. And Chinese people put their faith in Christ, not because they've been hoodwinked by some Westerner, but because they see the reality of Jesus Christ. And South Americans put their faith in Christ, not because they say, oh, the white man has arrived. Whatever you say, white they man, say we'll they, believe. They Baloney. Reality. And they could give a rip about your iPads and your iPods. No offense to the money you've spent on them. They could give a rip, all right? They're into searching for truth. And they have seen that Jesus Christ is the truth, and they put their faith in him. And I applaud them for that. And I would never step into the hole you've just dug of saying, oh, yeah, we really do know why Africans believe in Jesus, because they were really impressed with the sophisticated technology of white people. Give me a break. It's totally false. It's highly disrespectful for the African people, the Chinese people, and the South American people. People that came over to this country started Christian missions. Yes. Spanish missions. I mean, yes. Christianity has been spread in that manner. I mean, it's been literally pushed on, civil, on other civilizations. Well, whenever a missionary uses force to convert anybody, that's evil. Jesus never coerced anybody. And if anybody points a gun at someone and says, either believe in Jesus or I'm going to blow you away, you know that that's evil, according to Christ, because Christ never called his followers to do that. So we abhor that, that's tragic. You say we that, agree on that. You say, sure. You say that Christ reveals himself to these people. Yes, that's right. 
And how? Through By his Holy Spirit, he draws people to himself by them reading the Gospels in their own language, not in English, but in their own language, and they begin to understand who Jesus is. They put their faith in him. Would you, do you think that God has revealed himself to me? Absolutely, yes. Since I know of, of the Bible and everything. No. You look at creation and it points to a creator. It, uh, sure, you sure. have a conscience, it points to a moral lawgiver. We can, we can talk about, we can talk about the watchmaker God, the nameless mm -hmm. God all we want. Specifically Christianity, why? Well, you have the opportunity to read the Gospels. You're either going to read them or you're not going to read them. But if you don't read them, let's not act like you're open to searching for God. You, you've made a decision. I don't want to. I'm not interested. I respect your right to make that decision. To say that I haven't legitimately tried is to not give any concern as to what my past is like. Sir, I, I don't know whether you've legitimately I tried or not. I don't right. know that. I said, I if, if you don't read the Bible, yeah, so what? Just because you're raised Catholic doesn't mean you've read the Bible. Exactly, it doesn't, but I have re read parts of it. Good. I won't say that I've read it from cover to cover. I'll never claim that. Well, please read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Half of it, collectively. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. The Find out about Jesus. lovely old New Testament, okay. Yeah, the New Testament. Just read those four Gospels, that's all. Why don't we chuck out the Old Testament? Well, fine, if you want to chuck it out, chuck it out. Just read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son. It's a story about a father who had two sons, and one day the son said to his father, Dad, I want the inheritance now. I don't want to wait till you're dead, but I want to live as if you're dead. And with tears in his eyes, the father handed the inheritance to the son. He understood he could not force his son to love him and to live together with him in his home. So he gave the inheritance to the son, and the son grabbed it and ran off to a distant land. He was trying to find gusto and fulfillment and meaning in life. And so he bought into the props that his culture offered. He bought into the prop of wild parties, of stimulating his nerve endings, because he thought that was what life was all about. But one day he ran out of all his money and he couldn't afford the parties any longer. And he turned to his friends and he said, help, would you please help me? But his friends said, no, you have no more cash. We're not interested in you. The young man cried out in his hunger, help, will somebody please help me? A man said, yeah, I'll help you, go feed my ping, pigs. How ironic, a Jewish young man who views pigs as unclean animals has the job of feeding the pigs. Hunger is gnawing in his stomach so badly that he begins to wish that he were a pig so that he could fill his stomach with the worms and the pods. And then Jesus said, the young man had a thought. He remembered his father's love. And he said, you know something? The servants in my dad's house are being treated better than the way I'm being treated. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go home. And I'm going to confess, Dad, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Could you find it in your heart to take me back simply as a servant? And the young man got up and he put one foot in front of the other and he returned home. But when he got home, his father ran and greeted him, wrapped his arms around him. And as the young man began his confession, the father interrupted him and cried out to the servant, quick, kill the fatted calf. We're going to feast and celebrate for this son of mine was lost and he's found. He was dead and he's alive again. But son in that story is you and me. You see, we've gotten confused about what is real. We've reduced reality to simply matter and energy. When in reality, God exists and matter, the universe, comes from God's good creative hand. You see, in reality, there's a God at the center of the cosmos who loves you and who's very competent. He's very intelligent. He's very creative. He's all powerful. And if you and I miss God, we're missing the greatest part of reality. Why is knowledge so important? Because knowledge ties us into reality. If you have a brain problem and you need surgery, you don't just go to anybody. You go to a brain surgeon. Why? Because that brain surgeon has knowledge. And they're just not going to root around in your brain. They're going to repair your brain. If your car breaks down and you're like me and you know very little about mechanics, you don't just go to anybody to fix your car. You go to someone who has knowledge of a car. Now, what is reality? 
obviously reality includes the physical. And with our senses, we pick up on the physical. But Jesus Christ insisted that the physical comes from God. God created matter and energy out of nothing. He's the eternal God. Matter and energy are not eternal. God created in the beginning. And God created you and me to live in a love relationship with himself. But like the father in this parable of the prodigal son, God does not force us to stay at home with him. He doesn't force us to live in relationship with him. God refuses to ravish us. Instead, he woos us. Why? Because he's given us free will, because he loves us. And love refuses to force. A parent does not brainwash their child if they love their child. They woo their child, they teach their child, they sacrifice for their child. What is real? Obviously, matter and energy are real. And God has given us rational minds and senses to pick up on material, physical reality. But guess what? At the core of the, be of the universe is a God who's competent, who loves you, and who created matter and energy, and who gave you the gift of life. Jesus Christ revealed God accurately. He revealed that God loves you and that he's amazingly gracious. Jesus bled and died on a cross to pay the penalty that you and I deserve for turning our backs on God and going our own way. Is it not time for you to get in touch with reality? To get in touch not just with the physical material world, but also to get in touch with the God who created the universe, who gave you the gift of life, who's competent and good, and who loves you more deeply than anybody else in the cosmos. Look at Jesus Christ. He revealed God most clearly. And he revealed that God loves you and created you to live in relationship with him. I encourage you right now, humbly ask Christ to forgive you for your wrongdoing. Put your faith and trust in him and commit your life to live for him by his grace. That is the most important decision a human being can make. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Saks Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Saks Middle School. I'd love to personally invite you to join us this Sunday, 9.30 for our worship service. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day. Where's the sacred and the holy? world full of choices where's the truth in all the voices give me an answer don't waste my time